right, this is a blaring out with Eric Flair show tonight. Coming to you from Ross the Cowboy Records in beautiful downtown Tustin, California with Orange County punk rock legend Rick Agnew. How would you describe the Agnew family dynamics during your youth? Functionally dysfunctional. We moved around a lot and every time we moved into a neighborhood we were considered like the Munsters or Adams family of the neighborhood. We were always kind of looked upon as being different and strange, but uh, all the same people, like they liked us because we were, well, functionally dysfunctional. That's the only way I could really describe it. It's a time we thought that, you know, our family's weird, and all these normal families that you see on TV and stuff. But then when you looked in the, you know, behind closed doors and everything and stuff, we just wore ours on our sleeve. We just wore ours, you know, right there. So what you see, what you see is what you get. And then we discovered more and more that other, these other families have like a lot of skeletons in the closet and hidden secrets. We fit in just perfectly. And what high school did you go to? I went to Fullerton High School and uh, I wasn't never really, a tr I laid low under the radar and uh, I didn't have any learning dysfunctions either. I graduated with a 4.2 my senior year. Um, all I had was homeroom. It was the uh, civics class because that's, you have to have something. And this was before the GED test or whatever they call that thing. That was a couple of years after my time. So otherwise I would have been out of there a year sooner. You know, I just got straight A's and I excelled extremely well in, in school. And that's because it was super easy and I just wanted to get the hell out of there. You didn't like high school? Fucking, I hated it. it was, I loathed it. It was just such a, I don't know, it's just, to me it just reminded me of a social setting where it's like, okay, and we're gonna put together these people while, while they're going through changes like puberty and, and you know, at their, you know, they got all this angst into, you know, all this glandular shit happening, going crazy, and they're supposed to learn stuff for your life, I mean. You know, and then it just, you know, you had the jocks, you had the cheerleaders and everything. It destroyed more than it taught socially. It already set you out. I mean, by the time you left high school, if you weren't very, very strong and very, very independent, it could either crush you or make you believe in a bunch of lies that wouldn't, you know, happen later, like they're jocks that get married to cheerleaders and stuff. And they think, oh, the world's their oyster and they're going to be this and that. Go see them, you know, 10, 20 years later at a high school reunion, which, by the way, I never went to. And, uh, you know, these jocks have been just sitting around getting fat and the cheerleaders, you know, and they lie to you. They just completely lie to you. Where did you meet Casey? Well, we had a studio, the Mechanics, which were a band that pre preceded all the Orange County punk rock scene and everything. They were influenced by rock as well as punk. And so... We all loved them and we all followed them, we being the bands that sprouted from the Orange County scene. They had a uh, studio where I lived and the band rehearsed and it was right literally around the corner from the Continental Room over there by downtown Fullerton. And uh, right across Commonwealth there was a, a drinking place called I Drink With My Shrink. And, uh, and on, uh, I forgot what day it was, you could get quarter beers. So we'd get all together, we'd get like 100 beers and just set them on the table. And then they start having bands play above on the st stage thing. And one night, night when we went there to see the mechanics and stuff, uh, these guys showed up. They were called Social Distortion. They were from the Troy area and stuff. And they heard about the mechanics and the, about shows there. So they showed up and everything. And we're like, oh, wow, OK, cool. And then uh, this one Volkswagen bug comes by and starts giving us razz about being punkers and stuff. And all of a sudden, <laughs> half a brick comes flying down the uh, down the alley <laughs> and smashes the back window out of that Volkswagen. The guy gets out and everything and he starts, you know, and everybody just kind of pinned him up against the car and just goes like, what, what do you think you're doing, you know? Leaving, yeah, that's what we thought, you know, and then, um, and then it was like, who threw that anyway? And, <laughs> and there's Casey standing there going, <laughs> That's when I first met him. I go, dude, I like you. <laughs> How did your parents, Richard Agnew Sr. and your mother, Leah Agnew, inspire you, Frank, and Alfie musically? Just besides having the radio on and playing records and things like that, you know, we just, it was in our de genetics. My grandpa on my mom's side was a drummer. He was a very famous Latin drummer who's 
worked a lot, played in LA a lot with bands and everything, kind of the Ricky Ricardo type of dude. My dad, he, he got an acoustic guitar when we were real little and stuff, and he'd sit there and pick out like one note songs and sing to it, like like Wings of a Dove and stuff, stuff like that. He was more into like that kind of Eddie Arnold, you know, and then the Irish music, because he is Irish, Clancy Brothers and Irish Rovers. My mom being Mexican, she was more into like, you know, mariachi and stuff, but then she liked oldies, she liked everything. But she'd listen to like stuff like, you know, uh, Sergio Mendes and Brazil 66 mm -hmm. and things like that. So it was a, like a wide range of stuff. My sister, my older half sister is, who is basically very, very responsible for me getting into music and wanting to be a musician and stuff. She turned me on to like Beach Boys, Four Seasons and stuff. And I was like, yay. And uh, then of course the Beatles hit and Stones and it was, that was all great and everything. We saw Beatles on Ed Sullivan's show. I'm sure anybody, no matter how old they are, remembers when they saw that, because the whole like world, man, it was weird. You could just feel it. There was this like, whew, you know, a focus. And um, after we watched it, um, my dad pulls out his acoustic guitar and these neighbors we never met before came over with their acoustic guitars. And they're trying to play like Beatles songs. Everybody is like very inspired. When I saw that, I thought, I want to be a beetle. And then I saw the monkeys on, you know, TV and it's like, oh, I want to be a monkey and a beetle. You know, I want to be one of those guys. And um, then I saw the doors on Ed Sullivan show, decided I wanted to be a keyboard player like Ray Van Zarek. Then I saw Jimi Hendrix and it was all over. <laughs> Jimi, Jimi Hendrix is like my higher, higher power, my God. I mean, he really is. If anybody says your favorite musician, your, your, your hero, your role model, Jimi Hendrix, definitely. So if you could collaborate with any living or dead musician, that would be Jimi Hendrix. I don't know if I could collaborate with him, man. I'd just sit there and like, you know, <laughs> in awe, like that time when I was in the Mau Mau's and um, Robbie Krieger came up on stage and played the end with us. And almost the whole time, I was just like so stoked that there was a door next to me, you know, that most of the time I was feeding back and just kind of like looking at him. You know, <laughs> he looked at me like, dude, <laughs> like, what? Yeah, like I was a weirdo or something. How long were you in the Mau Mau's for? Off and on a few months, you know, a couple times. Once was with Don Bowles from the Germs and uh, a guy named Daz, myself. Uh, I forgot the bass player's name. He's still around. And then Rick and uh, was living with him there in Hollywood for about a month in his apartment he had. Later on, we tried to bring it up again and, and you know, do the Mau Mau's, but sorry, Rick, but unfortunately, <laughs> you couldn't keep timing or anything if it, your life depended on it, man, because he's kind of, eh, he's special, that's all you can say. What year was that? Mid-90s, maybe. How old were you when you discovered the mechanics? <laughs> 70, let's see, that was, well, before the mechanics, Scott sang with a band called the LA Brats. And before that, there was Wink. My neighbor around the corner, he was a bass player, Eddie Back, for a band called Wink. And they went through a couple singers and Scott from Mechanics, who is now in Poop, was the, uh, was the lead singer. And I saw him at the, I met him at a party when he was singing for, for Wink. It was like, this was like 74. Four, something like that and um, they're playing this garage and he's wearing like a nose ring an earring I mean back then that was just like you know and um, <clears throat> these like balloon pants and no shirt a, a leather vest um, nipple ring and these platforms that were really tall. And they did try and catch roll in and he starts strangling himself with the cord until he was like purple practically. And then just went on singing and stuff and it was almost hitting like people that were sitting in the front row with his mic stand and stuff, just going wild. His hero was Iggy Pop, so there you go. And then um, somebody threw a jar of mayonnaise up to him and <laughs> he took the mayonnaise and he just starts like, like he's scrubbing his arms with it and all of his chest and everything, big glops and <laughs> puts a big glop in his mouth and likes to go ah, like that. And then he takes a big handful and just starts rubbing it down his pants and stuff and he, pulled, <laughs> he whips out his willy. And let me tell you, that guy, 
I mean, he was able to like slap girls in the face with it in the front row, and I'm just going like, you know, like these guys were standing there like they're gonna kick his ass and everything. And girls were like, didn't know whether to like scream and, and run or they just had like kind of this frightened look, but at the same time they're like, <laughs> wow. just all focused on his willy. And um, yeah, after I saw that, I just went like, that, now that's a singer. That, <laughs> I gotta be in a band with that guy one of these days. And the closest I could get was when he was in the mechanics when they started that, and I was their roadie. I lived at the studio with them, and they're, you know, and I just love being their roadie. I, you know, all the shows and everything that just, you know, uh, would help out and everything. And just like one of these days, man, I'm going to be in a band with that dude. And it took a long time, but finally it did. It took him being in prison for seven years and getting out, and then. When I started talking to him, when I found out he was out of the prison, it's like, hey, well, how are you doing? Is everything okay and stuff? I go, hey, dude, you want to start a band? <laughs> He's all, sure. And I go, all right, what do you want to call it? And he goes, poop. And I go, poop, why? And he goes, why not? And I go, okay, it's all good, you know? Okay, so how influential were guitarists from the mechanics, Tim Rocca and Dennis Catron? Oh, the whole band was influential to me to this day. You know, Tim Rocca has a lot, if not most, of, of the sound that they call the OC sound or the, you know, the, whatever, they have different names for it. But I learned that basically exclusively from him and being a Cheap Trick fan too. And Mitch Ryder used it, that kind of sound. I, I just, I liked it because it was like, you could put a, a third, you know, melody into the music, you know, made it more like how classical is built with different counterpoints going on. Cause it just seemed like rock anymore was just being limited to like, you know, riffage and, you know, stroking off kind of leads and kind of shit, you know, stuff, which I love to do too. I mean, it's fun. But to build a song, it was, yeah, very influential. Almost every song I ever write, I, I my hat's off to Tim Rocca. Uh, Dennis, I like the way he stood when he played stuff, and he, he, I watched him when he would do his riffage. And so, not him as much, not him as far as a r r uh, um, influence, but Tim Rocca definitely. In fact, there's a couple songs where it was, there used to be mechanic songs, uh, and always give him writing credit. Did they ever have any advice for you when you were younger? No. They were young themselves. They were too busy, you know, playing and writing and having fun and stuff. I was just like kind of a fly on the wall that could carry equipment. Scott and me just used to, let, and Dennis, we used to hang out at the studio all the time and just get, you know, rip for and drunk and get stoned or do like cannabinol or whatever, partying our heads off, you know. That was the main thing. Back then, you didn't really take music seriously. It was your hobby, it was your fun, it was, you know. Still is. Yeah, and then Sandy, still, to me, the best drummer ever. I would love to be in a band with him again, you know, because he took over after Casey had left for the adolescents, and boy, I'm not gonna say anything else. <laughs> so what was the best part of playing in Poop with Scott Hoagland? Being able to do those songs, there's a lot of them were mechanic songs that were never gonna see the light of day again, and took them and just kind of like, tweaked them a little bit, you know, to make them ours, but still give Tim Rocca the, the credit, you know, and Katrin where, you know, where credit was due. But it, it was kind of a band, well, first of all, to fulfill my dream of being in a band with Scott. And second of all, those songs were just gonna be laying to waste, you know, it's like, God, these songs gotta come. I mean, they influenced everybody and everything. So, you know, it, 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 they have to be recorded. They have to be out there. We did a single on Posh Boy Records and, to, to me, it's one of the best recordings I've been on and we've done to this day, you know, four songs, but it just, it, and it just would have really, really, really took off, I think, and everything and stuff. But there's this little thing called crystal method dream that just got in the way <laughs> and still does for some of them, you know? And that's, uh, finally gave up on that shit because, uh, well, I was gonna die. But you think that's why the mechanics never enjoyed the, the success that they deserved? Not then, no, no. The, the mechanics just kind of fell apart, broke up because of uh, what I like to call uh, like greenhorn uh, internal cancerous jealous, jealousy strife. <laughs> 
where everybody just kind of like before it even got big or anything and stuff they'd get into so many petty arguments mm -hmm. like most bands do when they're younger like that they get into petty ar arguments they you know the, it's the dumbest things and then they just well i quit no uh, well look at let's break with the band and that's what basically happened to them too now let's go deeper with casey were and what did you think of him as a person can you describe it same way i still feel about him and everything and stuff he's he's a nut job you know he's he's fucking out of his mind and he makes me laugh all the time and everything and i love that man to death he's like one of my besties you know and stuff but sometimes i get kind of pissed off at him everything but you know it happens how did mike ness come to recruit you on bass your brother frank agnew on guitar and casey royer on drums to form what would become social distortion in 78 okay frank was never in social distortion proper that happened after the writ the initial band broke up and or split up into factions like how TSOL did and other bands do that. They, they, they like almost like a cell, you know, like, mm -hmm. like they divide into two. And then there's this one and this one, like TSOL had the, the Joe Wood version and then they had the Jack version. Well, what happened was, you know, we'd go see the Social Distortion play a couple times and everything. And they had a bass player named uh, Marky, Mark Garrett, for God rest his soul. And uh, he was like a, you know, a hippie guy, but he was a bass player. So it was almost like, you know, there wasn't that many punks that played back then. So they, they knew him through Troy High School and stuff. So they had him on bass. And then when I mentioned this interest about how great their songs were, you know, and you see them at parties and stuff. It's like they had a singer named Tommy Corbin at the time. He was six foot nine. He was the center for uh, Cal State Fullerton's basketball team that went on to nationals and that saved so he's like a college jock by day and uh he also was doing media he wanted to be a newscaster and he ended up being a newscaster but by night he was just a wild punker you know singer and he had an amazing voice you know it was just like if you could hear his earlier stuff by social distortion when he was singing it was amazing stuff i can never get used to what i call the foghorn you know we know what we we're talking about mr <clears throat> this. What happened was Mike Ness was just such a punk and he was so into him and, and Dizzy. Dizzy was always like his, his side guy, Dennis Donnell, was always hanging out with them. Didn't know how to play guitar yet or anything, but they, uh, they decided that Marky wasn't punk enough. He was just a stupid hippie, you know, and then now they got me, who was a punker that could play bass. So Mike was like, you know, you know, we're going to get rid of that fucking hippie, you know, get you in the band. And so at a practice, they went there and they, you know, they talked to him about it. And but then he comes out of the door and they're like beating on him, wailing on him. He's got like this bloody nose and everything. And he's just trying to cover up. I'm like, whoa, hey, hey you guys, man. And then they're like, get out of here, get out of here. They start kicking his car and stuff. And he was just like he was crying and everything and stuff. It was horrible, man. It was horrible. And. Uh, I felt horrible. I mean, I didn't want to even do it at that point, but it was like, you know, well, damage is done. And so, uh, yeah, he just looks at me before he leaves and he goes, well, I hope you're happy, Rick. You know, wiping his blood and stuff. And I'm just like, oh, man, it's not my fault. You know, but I guess I was the catalyst in it. So, and then we played parties and, you know, went on with it and everything. And it, you know, really loved it, man. It was one of my favorite bands to be in and everything. And then I don't know what happened from that point to where it became two social distortions. Uh, there was one where it was Mike Ness and Dennis Donnell. And well, the one that went on to make the single for uh, for Posh Boy, the 1945 mainliner single and uh, carry it on, on drums. And then there was uh, the, the version that you probably had heard about, which was Casey moved up to lead vocal. So DI wasn't his first lead, lead vocal thing. It, we had him singing. I played drums. Uh, my brother Frank Agnew and Tim Mag, who was in the mechanics for a while. And uh, he, they were the guitar players. And then we got Marky back on bass. <laughs> So I, obviously it didn't end horribly, you know, all was forgiven and stuff. And uh, 
We played a, that version of it played a couple shows, one in Santa Ana, where uh, it just went kind of crazy and stuff, and I threw a, I used to like to destroy my drum set, I took a, 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 a floor tom, and I threw it out the audience, and when I did, it like bounced, and then it smacked Casey right in the head, <laughs> and it split his head open. That kind of shit just happened normally, you know? It just happened, that was punk rock. And then we played a Fullerton High School dance, and they were sitting there with their little meter thing saying we were too loud and everything and stuff. So I got mad and I started throwing my drums at all the kids that were at the dance and stuff and, and just start screaming at the person doing that. And then they took me into a room, you know, on the side and go, listen, we're gonna call the cops, you keep this up, da 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 da. It was always ugly life. <laughs> punk rock so there were two social distortions playing at the same time well yeah in the earlier incantation when i was on bass and we played you know a few parties and stuff um one of the most infamous parties i hear about is what it was a uh, asian oranges first show party or whatever and stuff with the three piece you know with steve soto and and uh mike palm and scott miller and they opened <laughs> you know it was at a house on your Belinda and Rose, or Rose and Imperial, right over there. These uh, two midget twin girls were in the punk rock, and they put out an ad in the Fullerton uh, Junior High School and the university uh, newspaper saying, you know, any punks or whatever in the area, we're gonna have to get together and you know have have a party. We can all you know sh share, like gather, you know, congregate. And so a bunch of us did and everything. And then we planned on having a party at that house. And so they played and, um, and Eddie's subtitle was there. By the way, Eddie's subtitle is coming down in a couple, about a couple months with his new band wow. and everything. That guy's like in his 70s and he still looks the same. He's it's amazing. He was there, Mike Patton from middle class was there. There's like a lot of people that are in the scene now were there and um, so, when we when we start playing, so to start to start playing, what would happen around those times was any time there was any kind of a punk rock party or punk rock thing going on, there was always this big group of Hessians that would come and want to kick punk ass, you know, <laughs> and just they'd gather, but they'd never come in the parties. They would always kind of stand outside and congregate and wait for like the opportune moment, you know, or jump people when they walked out and everything like that. They did it a couple times at like Naughty Women parties. Naughty Women was pretty much the very first punk slash glam band from here. Bill Evans that owns uh, uh, Black Hole Records. Mm -hmm. With him, me off and on, about 80 other people off and on. But it, the main core of it was, um, was Bill and then Beatrice the Woman, who was uh, Bob Larson. We call him Beatrice the Woman because you know he would just dress like like a woman. <laughs> they were mainly influenced by like New York Dolls, Ramones, Pistols kind of thing, you know, so. And um, they're from, <laughs> it's such a time. Sorry, I start going Sounds into like it. Oh, it's hilarious, hilarious, yeah. hilarious. So how would you describe Mike Ness's personality and worldview at that time? <laughs> He was a punk's punk, man. I mean, that guy was like so, like, just head deep into it. I mean, his apartment was a black hole for Christ's mm -hmm. sakes, you know? And it was just 24 7, you know, partying and drugging and drinking and blasting, you know, punk rock music and stuff. And it was in an apartment complex. That kind of stuff could never happen these days, you know? But yeah, he was just all like, you know, he was, he was an anger, angry soul, but punk rock helped that, you know. And it, he had an attitude, it's like we used to like laugh about it. We'd go somewhere with him, you know, and stuff, you'd take him out in public and, you know, he'd be all punk to the nines, you know, and then he'd be walking along and everything. And that, you know, like I said, that's when everybody around, especially Orange County, would just be like, hey, Devo, hey, what the fuck are you supposed to be? Hey, it's not Halloween. And it wouldn't even get to that with Mike. We'd be walking to the liquor store, get more beer, and then all of a sudden, you know, they'd like these guys would look at Mike, and Mike would look at them, and then they'd look at them, and, and all of a sudden, next thing you know, there's just clobbering going on and stuff. And Mike wasn't that great of a fighter. 
So he always got the shit beat out of him. And this one time he came home and he had a big old hole in his head and everything and blood was coming down and the naughty women guys were with him and they were going like talking about it, you know, how funny it was, how, how the, the dynamics of how he would do that. And then Mike comes walking in and <laughs> He's got this whole head bleeding, but then he's got the 12 pack of beer and he's like, <laughs> wow. So he was, yeah, he was a 12, he was a true punker. He was like, he was kind of like, you know, London 77 punk personified, you know, living it for reals or whatever and stuff. No, no Malcolm, no Malky Walky creation there. That guy was homegrown and he lived next door in an apartment with his sister, his brother Troy, and his mom, who at the time was a rage and alcoholic. You know, I think since then things have cured. But um, so he ended up moving in next door with his friend Mr. Joe, who's still around. He was part of the whole Black Hole crew. Originally, the Black Hole was his next door there, that it was a, uh, an apartment that his uncle or his, you know, his last name is Von Forte, okay? So like they put him there because to keep him out of trouble or whatever and stuff. They had businesses, his his family and stuff like that, you know. Rick, why do you think commercially that social distortion stood the test of time? Well, when Mike took over and everything, it's like uh, he tended to lean more towards kind of a you know, roots rock kind of country feel. His, 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 his heroes were always like Johnny Cash and and um, Hank Williams as well as Johnny Rotten and Sid Vicious and The Clash and Sham 69, you know. So he, I think it's because his songwriting is so simplistic and it's, it's easily palatable. You know, he's like vanilla ice cream, basically. And, uh, he just, you know, plus he's always had that charisma and that charm that, that like, you know, uh, like, like an alley cat or a street dog, you know, it's like, he's like filthy and scruffy and just rrr, growling at you, but you can't help but want to pick, pick him up and pat him and take care of him and nurture him. And so I think that came through charisma, you know, and his confidence too, in his, his, his heart of hearts and mind of mind. That's what he was going to be. Is what he became, mm. you know. And nothing got in that. Nothing got in his way. Nothing veered him from it. He, he always was looking at that dream. Always had his eye on the prize, and he's got the prize now. And it's a good thing he cleaned up what he did too, because God knows what would have happened. You know, a lot of us. That's probably why we're still alive. You know, it's because cleaning up our act. And with Mike, I'm super proud of him. Every day, I'm very proud of them. You know, stuff. We lived together for a while too. Like when we had a place called Brea Beach, it was these apartments after the black hole uh, came apart and he had nowhere to go. And he always had people over, always had people over at his apartment. And um, he could have like, you know, no money and he'd have like a few frozen cheap burgers and some buns that he got from Wonder Bread. Uh, uh, what do they call those stores? You know, they have yeah. day old shit and yeah, all that. Yeah, Wonder Bread stores. Yeah, yeah you those. remember those? Yeah. And that's all he'd have in his house, and that's all the money. He'd, and, and and yet when he when you came over, he'd like, you <laughs> know, burger. You know, I mean, he was very very generous with whatever little he had, and it was all good. So, and I'm and then when he got kicked out of there, he had nowhere to go. So I had him, you know, sleeping on my couch for like about three months or so. Because I had an apartment over in Brea Beach, that's where Casey and his Casey Royer and his roommate moved, and a bunch of people moved there. <laughs> Half of the fun of him living there was just every night he'd go out, you know, gigging, and then he'd come home really fucked up, really drunk. <laughs> and that was my favorite part, <laughs> especially if I had a girl over. You know, I'd hear the knock on the door and the, the fiddling with the keys and stuff, you know, and I'd be like, you know, and the girl would be like, who's that? And I'd go, oh, that's my roommate. You didn't tell me I had a roommate. I don't, but he sleeps on the couch. It's Mike, Mike Ness, you know. And then I'd let, let him in. <laughs> his zipper would be down and stuff. He'd have piss, mix, piss marks down his jeans and stuff and just burping. And, <laughs> and that was my, I loved it. It was my entertainment, you know. But at the same time, I just felt like, you know, I got to take care of him. He's my pro. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, he just, I don't know where, 
what happened after that, blanks, blanks. At what point did the band that you and Casey were in stop being Social Distortion? Mike wanted us to be in back again, and it was like, did uh, Casey didn't want to do it, and I didn't want to do it, because he wanted Dennis in the band, and Dennis couldn't play. I'm teaching them, and it's like, no. Dude, we ain't got time to wait, you know? We want to k k carry on and stuff, so. Then um, went back to what we'd skipped was uh, one of the very first band, punk bands I was in that we also met at Drink and Shrink is the Detours. And that's where a lot of adolescent songs, DI songs, everything were written back when, back then. And uh, the Detours, and so, you know, I joined back in the Detours and uh, we did a recording one night and I played, we all switched instruments and did a cover of Loner with a Boner by Black Randy. And they liked my leads on it so much, they go, dude, you gotta be the lead guitar player and stuff, but we'll find a drummer. So I go, I got a drummer. And so Casey joined the Detours. And then from there, uh, I would try to get the, you know, the, the adolescents were starting, they were getting shows. Detours would be on the shows, but they'd never show up, you know? Yeah, I don't know what it is. Gordon, the singer, he just like had this weird thing where all of a sudden it just, none of them would show up. So I go, screw this, you know? And uh, the drummer of the adolescents got in a car, uh, car accident, pretty bad car accident, and he couldn't play the show. So they asked me if I'd fill in on drums for the show. And I go, sure. And then a couple of weeks later, John O'Donovan left the band and um, so he was, he was an original before, you know, and uh, who plays with Radolescence now. And so we did that show, and then a couple weeks later, they asked me to move to John O'Donovan's place on guitar. And they go, well, we need a drummer. Casey, <laughs> you know, I always drag Casey along, poor guy. <laughs> He's got to feel my wrath. But no, it was, that, that's how that's dissolved the whole social distortion thing just kind of naturally kind of went in traffic, you know. And then Mike took it as he should have because it was his band from the get-go. He started it, you know, he should. So after you guys left social yeah. distortion, you joined the Detours. Yeah. Okay, and then from the Detours, you went, you, be, you became an adolescent. It's funny because like a lot of that stuff happened within like about a three year period, three or maybe four at the most. So it's, it's crazy how it's just like, choo, 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 you know, and then like nowadays, like it just takes one of our bands like, you know, eight to 10 years just to put out a stupid album. <laughs> you yeah, know, that's one of the things that always fascinated me about the, the history of Orange County Punk was that it just seemed like you guys had this gold mine of musicians like, hey, B Joe Blow dropped out, let's just replace him with this guy. Like there'd always be a guy like waiting there to replace somebody else and you guys were all friends. Well, that's how we made friends in the first place is we were in the punk, we played, you know, we played music and that's and that all congregated at the black hole basically. Nowadays you got tons of musicians who, you know, that you could pick from and everything and stuff, but it's just not quite the s same. I mean, you know, everybody's got kind of like their idea of what they want to do or what they want to play kind of thing. And so back then it was just like, let's, let's sound like the Ramones or the Mechanics. And back then, if you went punk, you usually were like, you know, already a musician, you know, it kind of went hand in hand because punk was like people who want to be musicians and then they learn from the ground up, you know, and that's the way to do it. It's just grow, grow up on stage. Don't stick yourself in a rehearsal for five years and get perfect first. I've known bands that have done that, you know, they'll sit there, well, well we're almost ready, we're almost ready. And they never end up being ready because they're, they're looking for perfection. Perfection does not exist. Not in this, you know, um, mortal coil, it just doesn't.